So the uh, topic for this evening is not sure, as uh, my uh, uh, introducer uh, say, outlined, and uh, uh, sitting on Sukhumvit Road and not moving in a vehicle uh, with uh, the uh, evening scheduled to begin at 6.30 and realizing it's, uh, it was already past that. Then I thought, well, this is a very good uh, introduction for the evening. Not sure. Is Ajahn Amaro going to arrive? Uh, will he arrive? Uh, when's he going to arrive? Uh, what will happen? Uh, my nair. We don't know. It's not a sure thing. So that, uh, that was a very uh, sort of unplanned but useful preparation for uh, this evening because uh, this is the, the principle uh, that uh, say is a part of all of our lives. And so that uh, I'll offer a few reflections this evening on this theme and hopefully some of the things I say will be uh, useful for you. Oh, uh, when we meet with that feeling of uncertainty, um, then uh, usually what we do is we feel worried, we feel threatened. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so that uh, uh, what we tend to do is to try and fill up that unknown with uh, a plan. We fill it with, with ideas of, of what might happen. We are um, uh, often, uh, say, just uh, distracting ourselves. Well, uh, I don't want to think about the future. I'm worried about that. So I'll just look at my phone and catch up on my Facebook friends or uh, see what communications I've had coming in through line or what the what's on the news or something. So often we deal with that feeling of worry or uncertainty with choosing distraction or we just switch off. We go, go blank, go numb and just kind of shut the world down and disengage altogether. Because uh, the, the feeling of not being sure is something that most of us don't like and we relate to it as, as a problem, a feeling of uh, anxiety, uncertainty. So we automatically think of it as something that is a problem or something that is unwelcome. So uh, th this is good to explore and uh, it's uh, interesting to, uh, to consider because uh, life is, is always uncertain and if, uh, if the feeling of uncertainty was automatically a, a problem, you know, why would the Buddha encourage us to uh, investigate the, that quality of anicca, of, uh, of change. Uh, why would he uh, say this is something that's uh, good to look at and why is it that that uh, is say, spoken of by the great ajans, the great elders, as uh, the gateway to wisdom? Uh, when we, uh, uh, we look at the Buddha's teaching and uh, we uh, say many of us are probably familiar with the Buddha describing the, the three characteristics of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta, think everything is uh, in a state of change, uh, everything is not uh, able to be satisfying in and of itself and all things are not truly who and what we are. These are the principles of uh, anicca, dukkha, anatta. So I'm I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with these. If these are words you've never heard before, let me know. <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, guessing the kind of people who come and spend uh, a, a, an evening at the B World Fellowship of Buddhists, these uh, principles of uh, anicca, dukkha, anatta will be familiar. So usually the, the way the word anicca is translated is as impermanent, maitiang, uh, uh, that it's uh, something that's changing. But uh, it's uh, very interesting that uh, when uh, Lumpur Cha spoke about this, this quality, this factor of, uh, of existence, he almost always used the term minair, uh, uh, um, meaning uns uh, it's uncertain. Rather than impermanent, he would translate anicca as, as uh, uncertain. Now, it might seem like it's, uh, it's not much of a difference, but when we talk about something being impermanent, it's like a, it has a feeling of being something out there, like a factor of nature, like the sound of my voice is changing, or the, the sound of the air conditioner is changing, or the, the, uh, the, the mood in your mind is changing. It's, a, it's a, an object that is in a state of change. But uh, when we speak of a Nietzsche as uncertainty, 
In a way, that's how we receive that quality of change in the heart, that the felt sense of change is un uncertainty. So that's on the, in English you'd say that's on the subject side, whereas impermanence is on the object side. So the, when the heart meets with the, the actuality of change, what it feels is uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen next. So that's talking about the, uh, the feeling tone of the heart in the, in the face of that quality of change. Now when we, uh, uh, we look at the Buddha's teaching, then uh, uh, again, as I said, the, the Buddha encouraged us, encouraged us to investigate the quality of anicca, and, uh, and when you have a description of people realizing sodaban, realizing stream entry, oftentimes the way the insight is expressed is that uh, the, that person realizes everything that is subject to arising is subject to passing away, that whatever arises passes away. And so uh, why would it be that uh, the insight into stream entry, that kind of breakthrough to, uh, that guarantees enlightenment, uh, is somehow connected with the, the quality of, uh, of impermanence. You think, well, why does that make such a big difference? And, and besides, you know, it, isn't that something that would be, would be worrying, that you know, all that arises passes away? You know, we're, we, we meet with uncertainty. We, we don't know what's going to happen next. Why, why is that liberating? Why is that something that's important? Chiang Mai, is that right? So, the, uh, the reason why we, uh, uh, we say the Buddha uh, highlighted this is that because when we meet uh, the quality of, of uncertainty with a, a, uh, an attitude that's based on self-view, when the mind is, uh, is fixed on the feelings of I and me and mine, uh, when it's, what's going to happen to me? What am I going to feel? Is this going to work? Am I going to be happy? Am I going to lose the things that I've got? What, uh, what's happening with my health? Am I going to uh, get? Am I going to get a terrible illness? Uh, am I going to keep my job? Is my company going to succeed or is it going to fail? Uh, am I going to lose the ones that I love? It's all about I and me and mine. So that when the heart meets that quality of uncertainty uh, with an attachment to to self, uh, with uh, attachment to that I, me, and mine feeling then the natural result of that is fear. There's a sense of, of threat, of danger, like, what's going to happen to me? Uh, how's it going to be for me? So the, uh, the, the key difference between uh, the, uh, why the quality of, of uncertainty should be, uh, say, uh, threatening in one respect, but liberating in another, is that with stream entry, when the mind awakens to the Dhamma, uh, then there is a, a seeing through of self-view, that feeling of I and me and mine uh, falls away. And th then that quality of uncertainty, of the unknown, that is being appreciated with uh, the mind free of self-view. So that, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, say, the perception of change, the perception of, of the unknown uh, is, say, appreciated without that feeling of of. Uh, I and me and mine, without self-view. So, when the heart, uh, so when, the, you can say in English, when the ego meets with the unknown, it feels fear. But when the heart, the jitjai itself, when the heart meets with the unknown, it feels freedom. Does that make sense? So there's a, a radical difference, because the, uh, <coughs> when there's uh, no sense, of, when the ego has been let go of, when there is no sense of I and me and mine, then there's a, a, a quality of freedom because who is there to lose anything? Who is there that, to be threatened? Yeah, who is there that, that owned, that genuinely owned something that can be lost? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, the, uh, this, say the change of view or how we can transform uh, the experience of, un of worry and anxiety and fear of the future into uh, a quality of, of uh, say, uh, of joy, of freedom, is it all hinges around self-view and using the, the practice of Dhamma, using meditation, to bring the attention 
to those feelings of I and me and mine, to challenge those, to, to bring uh, the attention to that, see how much the mind invests in this body, this personality, these, uh, these plans, you know, my, my schedule of things to do, and, uh, uh, and who I am, the, uh, my role in life, uh, how, uh, how much money I've got, my status, you know, I can say, I'm a Buddhist monk, I'm an Ajahn, I have 39 vasa, 39 pansa, uh, I'm the jawat of what Amaravadi. So I can say, I have all those things, I am all those things, but it's my nair. <laughs> it's not a sure thing. So if I'm invested in uh, all those things that I am, I say, I just had a checkup at Samiti Vait Hospital yesterday, and I said, you're, you know, you're 61 years old, but uh, everything is working okay. Uh, no, uh, no significant problems at all. Satu, satu, satu. So it's good to hear, but there might be something that they missed. Yeah, my nair. <laughs> so, if we are invested in having good health or having our status, how many Facebook followers you have, how many friends, or how many people uh, are tracking you on Instagram, or how many people access your uh, your blog, or how uh, how uh, fast the shares of your company are climbing. If that uh, is invested in, if we have a lot of duoton in that, then we live in fear because we don't know are the, are the followers going to diminish? Uh, am I going to get unfriended? <laughs> is my company going to start going down? Uh, and so then uh, the degree to which there is uh, that sense of, uh, of I and me and mine invested, there'll be fear. But if there's a, 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 a lack of uh, self-view, if our work, we do our work, we carry out our roles in life, we fulfill our responsibilities without that uh, solid, uh, fixed sense of I and me and mine, then we can do our work and we can engage with, with others, we can take care of our responsibilities, can still be the jawat. They say, well, that's what it says on the number, on my business card. <laughs> it says I'm the abbot. But if I'm not invested in that, uh, if that's not taken as uh, me and mine, then I can play that role, I can have that, uh, that position, but it, it's not a burden, it's not a source of fear or anxiety. So when we uh, speak about uh, the use of the Buddha's teaching to help uh, free the heart from anxiety and to help us to uh, develop wisdom, this is the, I would say the central issue is bringing attention to those feelings of I and me and mine and to see how much we're invested in having a plan or you know, who we are, how we like to see ourselves. So uh, over the years, uh, Lumpur Cha, uh, he emphasized this teaching of Anichang. He said, uh, you know, he said, I've been uh, practicing Dhamma and teaching Dhamma for about 40 years and, and during all this time, all I've ever really seen is Anicca. That's pretty much it. That's the whole of the practice is seeing Anichang. And he said, oh yeah, and also patient endurance, Kwam uh, Oton. So just those two things, just anichang, uh, patient uh, 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 uncertainty, and patient endurance. So that's pretty much the whole of the practice. So Lumpur Cha was a very, very wise man, and so uh, and uh, yeah, I've been his student for 40 years, and uh, I would agree. Yeah, pretty much that's all there is <laughs> to to focus upon is this uh, seeing the quality of uncertainty, and then patient endurance, uh, dealing patiently and with an open heart with life's uh, struggles and difficulties and, and all its ups and downs. So uh, one of the, um, uh, the, say, the ways that the Lumpur speaks about this, which is really kind of uh, unusual, is that uh, he would say, uncertainty is the Buddha. Kwam mainer ben prabhutajau. So this is a, an unusual statement for a Buddhist monk to make. See, how could uncertainty is the Buddha? How do, how do you get that? So, and Lumpur Cha, just like the Buddha, he liked to use uh, ways of, of speaking that would get people's attention. So in the Buddha's time, when all the other yogis, the samanas and the spiritual teachers were talking about developing tapas or spiritual heat, the Buddha talked about nibbana, cooling down. So that's a kind of shocking way to speak. You know, let the fires go out, let, you know, let, uh, let everything cool down. It's like a opposite to the language that most people were using. So similarly, similarly, Lumpur Cha liked to use ways of speaking that would get people's attention. 
So he'd say something that's kind of unusual, startling, like, Kwam Maine, Maine Ben Praputa Chao. So how, how is it that the uncertainty is the Buddha? So he would say, you know, the Buddha said, if you see the Dhamma, you see me. If you see me, you see the Dhamma. Like in the famous dialogue that the Buddha had with the Bhikkhu Vakali. Uh, he said to Vakali, because uh, Vakali was sick and, and uh, was regretting that he hadn't had time to go and see the Buddha and pay respects. And the Buddha heard that he was ill, so the Buddha went to go and see him in his kuti. And, uh, and Vakali sort of struggled to get up from his sickbed and paid respects to the Buddha and, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, Venerable Sir, I haven't had the time or the ability to come and pay respects to you. And the Buddha said, well, why do you have to come and see this physical body, Vakali? You know, one who sees the Dhamma sees me, one who sees, sees me sees the Dhamma. So that was an important statement to Lumpur Cha. So he said, okay, so if you see the Buddha, you see the Dhamma. If you see the Dhamma, you see the Buddha. So what is the Dhamma? The truth of uncertainty is the Dhamma. So uh, that which sees the truth of uncertainty uh, is the, the, the Buddha mind. So if you, uh, in, if you follow the logic of that, you know, that which knows uncertainty is the awake mind, is the, 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 the one who knows, the Puru. So if you see the, the truth of uncertainty, that is seeing the Buddha, and that is that which knows the uh, the truth of uncertainty, yeah, that is the, the Buddha mind. So that uh, you, in this way, the uh, Lumpur Chao would say, uncertainty is the Buddha. This is, uh, uh, say, the mind that knows that quality of, of, of change, of uncertainty, uh, of instability. Uh, that is the uh, awake mind that is in tune with reality, in tune with Dhamma. And so this can sound a little bit philo philosophical or like, oh, I couldn't quite follow the logic or how does that work? Or that can seem a bit abstract. But uh, on, a, on a practical level, uh, what uh, Lumpur Cha would encourage is as to, the more you can develop this recognition of uncertainty, to remember everything is unsure, then the more that you will bring your heart into alignment with Dhamma, the more you will embody that puru, that, that quality of awareness. If you open your heart to the quality of change, then uh, that, uh, the, that openness, that awake quality, that is the very awareness, that awakened awareness that is the same as the mind of the Buddha. That's the awake, aware mind. That is the puru of our own heart, that quality of awareness within us. And that is a true refuge. That's a true safe place, a true sarana, a true a foundation and uh, a, um, a basis for our, our, uh, our kind of security in life. So, this, uh, so it will be in, in terms of looking at uncertainty in terms of your, uh, your success. You say, okay, right now I've got financial security, but my uh, nair, it's not a sure thing. Maybe the bank will collapse. Maybe during the course of this Dhamma talk, the bank has already collapsed. My nair. Yeah, it was an unsure thing whether I would get here or not. Sitting in the car with uh, with my trusty chauffeur, Yom Tai. Oh, it's already 6.34. I'm supposed to be there at 6.30. Will we arrive? My nair. So if we let go of self-view and say, I should be there. I'm not there. I, I'm letting everybody down. I, I, I. If we let go and say, well, I can sit in the car and create and create uh, suffering, or I can sit in the car and not create suffering. <laughs> then in that moment we can see that uh, the opening to that quality of uncertainty, well maybe I'll get there, maybe I won't. It's, it's this way, Banyang Ni Eng. It's in this moment, it's like this. Maybe the bank has not crashed at all, maybe your savings have increased well, the Dhamma, since the Dhamma talk has begun. Maybe the bank is doing really well and your investments have, have cranked up. Maybe uh, your Facebook page has been unfriended by 50 people since the Dhamma talk began. Or maybe it's gained another 50 people. My nair. So if we turn our attention to that, and if we listen to that voice in our heart that says, don't say that, don't say that. You know, that that's bad luck to think that way. That we can listen to that, that fearful, uh, uncertain, agitated thing, and say, oh, that's just the... The, uh, the reactive mind, the worrying mind, uh, creating an, uh, an arom, uh, creating a mood, that's all. That too, is un uh, uh, that too is a changing thing, it's an uncertain thing. It comes, it goes, it changes. 
So when we are ready to look at every aspect uh, of our life as uncertain and uh, our own perceptions, our own judgments, then we find that uh, if we bring our attention to it and consciously open the heart uh, to that uncertainty, then there's a freeing. It's challenging to the ego. It's the ego, the duodon, the, the atta, that says, don't say that, don't say that. <laughs> it's the ego that is having the kind of f the anxious reaction. But at the same time, the heart is saying, of course, how could it not be uh, uncertain? How could it be a sure thing? Just like when, uh, if we like something, maybe there's a particular kind of food. We say, oh, this is delicious. And uh, uh, Lumpo Chao would say, well, you should ask a question. Is that so? Is that a sure thing? Then you recognize, well, I call it delicious, but uh, my friend, you know, they, they can't stand that. You know, that my, 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 maybe my friend is a vegetarian. So that I eat something that is, is uh, not vegetarian. Oh, this is a Roy Mark. And they go, oh, how can you eat that? Similarly, I'm, uh, I might be the vegetarian and I uh, think, oh, this is really lovely. This, this, um, this vegetable is really great. And the person who's not a vegetarian says, oh, do you really like that stuff? <laughs> so when we say, this is good, then we can recognize it's not a sure thing. It's not the same for everybody. Or maybe it's our favorite food and it's cooked just how, how we usually like. But then we're feeling ill. We have kind of... Um, uh, a kind of nausea, we're feeling, uh, feeling sick, so then it's our favorite food, and then we see it, and we go, ooh, <laughs> it's, uh, even though we usually like it, because our body is, is sick and we feel nauseous, then that same smell, that same uh, sight, it's, it's off-putting. So is it delicious? My <laughs> So when we are able to bring this uh, reflection on uncertainty to our judgments, to our feelings, our thoughts. When we say, that's good, is it a sure thing? Is that so? Is that a sure thing? Uh, if we say something, oh, that's terrible, that's awful. If we ask, is that a sure thing? Is that, is that the whole story? Then if we bring the attention to each judgment, each mood, uh, each opinion uh, in this way, then uh, by mindfully bringing our attention to that, then we see a change coming about. The wisdom of the heart is engaged. It's like you're, you're lighting up the lamp of wisdom that is your own heart. That's saying, oh, of course, it, it's dependent on, on my, me being hungry or dependent on me not being sick or that I've now chosen this particular diet or uh, uh, I have a preference for, for hot weather or cool weather. Uh, Oh, it's not a sure thing, it's not the whole story. And in that recognition, there's a quality of spaciousness, an openness, a freedom in the heart. So uh, the, uh, the, the essential part of this is having the sati, having the mindfulness to be watching the flow of your thoughts, right? Because mostly we have a flow of thinking and mood that is constantly saying, oh, this is good, and that's bad, I like this, I don't like that, this is good, this is awful, I like that person, I don't like that person, this is what I wanted to hear, this is what I didn't want to hear. And every thought we take to be absolutely true. Chame? Usually, If we think something, we assume that it's true. And uh, we don't question that. When we say, oh, this is delicious, we assume that's a fact, not an opinion. <laughs> right? If we say, oh, that person, that's a bad person, we, we take that to be absolutely true. So this is uh, uh, a way of, say, uh, that we have to uh, develop through mindfulness, the bringing mindfulness to our thoughts, to our emotions, to our moods. So that takes some work. Uh, so you, we have to, uh, first of all, bring into uh, consciousness the idea that not all our thoughts are reliable. Not all of our thoughts are true. Just like all the uh, advertising that you see around Bangkok and everywhere around the world, you know, it'll tell you, use this toothpaste and you'll be really attractive. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, uh, make yourself secure with this insurance company and you'll be totally safe. Yeah, invest in this bank and uh, your money is totally secure and you'll make a good profit. And 
that the advertisements make promises to us all the time. Chai Mai? That's the, and some of, maybe some of you are in advertising and you say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it, uh, any advertisement can only be part of the story. If it's promoting one, one company, it's kind of telling you that they're better than the other companies. It's a biased view. So our thoughts are just like advertising. I'm not saying advertising is bad, or all our thoughts are bad, but it's a limited view. So just as if you're wise, you won't believe all the advertising. And similarly, if we're wise, we won't believe all of our thoughts. Does that make sense? So that if you uh, relate to your thoughts, rather than being a statement of truth, more like, okay, just hearing something being said on the radio, it's just like looking at the adverts or hearing a program on the TV, so that we, we notice our thoughts, we hear our thoughts, but we don't automatically believe them. We don't take them to be the whole story. It's just a passing perception. So when we do this, then it, we change the attitude towards our thinking, that we recognize. It's, uh, and I like to encourage people to relate to, to their thoughts as if you're hearing the the radio from your neighbor. You didn't even choose the station. It, you, but you're hearing it, or like sitting in an airport when you have a TV going in the airport lounge. You didn't choose the station, but it's, it's there, and you can hear it, or you can see the information. It has an effect, but you're not really interested, and uh, you're not sort of drawn in, but it, it's around. So if we relate to our thoughts in that same kind of a way, so that we are, as a... Uh, we're paying attention, okay, I'm, my mind is approving of this, saying this is beautiful, this is good, or disapproving of that, oh, that's painful, that's horrible. So, okay, that's uh, part of the story, but it's not, it's not the whole story. It's not a sure thing. Uh, when we uh, change the view of our thoughts and our moods in this way, then we find our life is a lot more spacious. We, we find ourselves much more adaptable to circumstances. So th there's an old story that they, uh, in a, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they talk about a, um, uh, a, f a poor family in a Tibetan village up in the mountains. And they only had one valuable possession, and that was a, a female horse. That was the one precious thing they had, and, uh, and they were otherwise they were very, very poor, and had no other valuable things. And then one day, the, the mare ran away. She escaped from the pen, she sort of knocked her way through the stone wall and ran away. And so then everybody in the family, the mother and the father and the, and the, the son, they're all crying, oh, it's terrible. We've, the one precious thing we had, our, our beautiful horse, and now she's run away. Now we've lost everything. It's a disaster. And then the grandmother, who's the, the wise elder in this story, then the grandmother says, uh, uh, it's not a sure thing. And they go, how can you say that? It's not a sure thing. I mean, the, our one valuable possession, the, our mare has run away. Now we've lost everything. But Granny says, well, wait and see, but it's not a sure thing. So a few days later, then the, the mare, the female horse, comes back with a male horse, with a stallion in tow. She's found a boyfriend. So, oh, wow, we've now got the female horse, we've got a male horse, we can, ha we can have a whole horse farm. This is great, this is fantastic. Now we're really, we're really going to make it. Finally, we've got success for the family and everyone is, is laughing and applauding and is so pleased and happy and then, uh, and then they uh, say well granny why aren't you why aren't you smiling why aren't you happy you know, uh, aren't you glad that we're now, we can now start a whole horse farm and she says well it's not a sure th you know, it's not a sure thing that it's it's good fortune you know, maybe uh, maybe there's uh, there's more to it and they say oh you're a you're so negative you're so kind of sour you, you know, you've always got a a uh, different take on things here. Yeah. Come on, celebrate! This is a great day. So then, a little while later, the the son in the family, you know, being 13 years old, you know, it's a bit reckless. Having been a 13 year old boy myself, you know, you don't have a lot of fear. So he thinks, yeah, well, that the mare is kind of small and slow, but this stallion, the male horse, whoa, it's a big and fast. I'm going to ride him. So the 13 year old boy climbs on the back of the stallion. Whoa, off he goes and goes racing across the, the, the valley and then jumps over a stone wall and then trips and the boy falls off, <coughs> breaks his leg. So then uh, <coughs> the, uh, they, the, boy, the stallion comes back without the boy on his back 
And oh, where's our boy? And they go out and they find him lying in the field with a broken leg. And oh no, this is a disaster. Our only son, he's got a broken leg. Oh no, no one will want to marry him. Uh, we're going to have a cripple in the family. Uh, we're going to take forever to look after him. It'll be so difficult. And uh, what are we going to do? It's a disaster. Yeah, and then they, everyone is crying again, and then they, and then they see that Granny's not crying. They say, Granny, aren't you upset? Our boy's broken his leg, he's going to be sick, he might be disabled for life, and uh, this is terrible, this is a disaster. And Granny, of course, says, not a sure thing. You know, so they're, oh, you, 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 know, you don't know what you're talking about, this is, the, this is the crisis, our family's ruined, you know, we're never going to get anywhere, our boy's got a broken leg, you know, this is a terrible problem. She said, well... You may say so, it's not a sure thing. So then uh, the, the boy gets his leg strapped up and he's lying out in the back of the house. Then the army comes through recruiting. There's a new war on with, with Bhutan. And so that uh, okay, the, the local warlord is coming through. Yeah, every, boy, every boy between the ages of 10 and, and 25, okay, you've got to join the army. No excuses. So, well, our boy's got a broken leg. A broken leg, well, I don't want him. He can stay, but all the others we're taking. So then they leave with all of the young men, everyone between 10 and 25 from the whole village. And then, so suddenly the boy with the broken leg is the only, the only marriageable boy in the whole village. So then all of the teenage girls start showing up at his place. And, and then all of the, uh, the marriage prospects for their son. Oh, this is great. This is amazing. We were so poor, we would never have a chance. But now even the headman's, the headman's daughter is coming around, kind of making eyes at our boy. This is great. Now we're really, we're really happy. Everything's going to go great. And of course, Grandma says, well, it's not a sure thing. <laughs> and on and on and on and on and on. So uh, uh, this is a, 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 uh, an ancient tale, but it has a great relevance in our modern life. So it's easy for us, when things go well, we kind of get drunk on happiness and success. You know, that your, your company is doing well, that you're, you get an award as the, you know, the best doctor or the best teacher, your Facebook page gets you know, followed by, gets, you get friended by tens of thousands of people, and you know, oh, I'm so happy, this is so great, you know, I got this special award, my book got published, and then uh, we get drunk on that, we get carried away, we think uh, everything is perfect. And so then we have to, at that point, remember Granny saying, well, it's not a sure thing. <laughs> so uh, I like to do a little exercise with people when I talk about this subject. So uh, what I suggest is if you bring your attention, look at your life and cast your mind back five or ten years when you got that book published or you got the, the promotion or you're, you're, you, uh, you started the new company and you're making piles of money and you thought, oh, this is great. I got the appointment, I got hired by this prestigious outfit, uh, I got the award, my book got published, uh, you know, everything is really great. And you look back now, five or ten years later, and you realize, I can't believe I'm, I was celebrating. Yeah, that, uh, that I was so happy on that day, but little did I realize what kind of trouble was going to come from that. You know, oh, when I look back... Uh, Little did I know how much uh, of a headache that was going to be. Any of you had that kind of experience? Can you think of that five or ten years ago? Something you were celebrating then and now you look back and you go, oh, that's, uh, that was a real headache. Is that familiar to anybody? Yeah. Okay, so what does that tell you about success? Dong Rawang, no? Be careful. <laughs> so, similarly, we can look back five or ten years at something that was a real disaster when we bought you got fired from that job, your company crashed, your, uh, you got, um, your book got rejected by every publisher, uh, you launched some project, you spent tens of millions of baht and the whole thing caved in and you lost all the money. It was a complete, uh, a complete mess. And at the time you were crying, it was, a, it was depressing and awful. And now, five or ten years later, you can look back and say, well, I would never have chosen that, but actually that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Any of you ever had that kind of experience? Yeah, a few people nodding around the room. So for most of us, uh, it's been that way. So what does that tell us about failure? Or having an illness, you know, or having a heartbreak, you know, and disappointment. So when we look at that, then it, it tells us to, when things are successful, my nah. When things are, are, are a failure, my nah. 
it helps us to see things in a broader perspective. So uh, what this is doing is going against those habits of our mind that like to invest in our reputation, in our money, in our status, in our possessions, in our friends, and it's helping us to be independent. So where w another of the ways that the Buddha spoke about stream entry, about sodaban, is he said such a one is independent of others in the uh, the teachers uh, in the the Dhamma teaching. So whether you get praised, sabai; so you get criticized, sabai. So Everything goes well, sabai. So Everything goes badly, sabai. So you're 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 not dependent on others for your own happiness. It doesn't mean that you're just like a sociopath. <laughs> you kind of bit for do. You kind of shut everybody out. But your happiness is dependent on the mind's uh, attunement to the present reality. It's not uh, dependent on gaining or losing. It's not dependent on praise or, or criticism. It's not dependent on good fortune or, or bad fortune, but rather it's the happiness of the heart awake to its own nature, the heart awake to the Dhamma. So, uh, the <coughs> uh, so what I would encourage is that developing this kind of sati, mindfulness of our moods, the arom, mindfulness of our thoughts, and, and notice during the day, whenever you make a judgment, this is good, this is bad, I like, I don't like, I want, I don't want, to remember to bring that uh, that question. Is that a sure thing? Is that so? Is that is that for sure? And then watch what happens in your heart when you ask that question. Is this a sure thing? Uh, is that, uh, is that the, the whole truth? Is that the whole story? You can work out your own wording, exactly how you want to phrase it. Use your own words. But ask that kind of question. Make that kind of challenge. And notice how the ego, go, the, ego the door down goes, but, 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 ah, la, la. <laughs> So the ego doesn't like it because it wants to, to invest in being a doctor, being a teacher, being a, an ajahn, being a... Uh, a good mo a good mother, a good father, you know, a uh, a famous person, you know, someone who's competent, respected. It 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 likes that, and when something challenges that, it says no no no, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. So the ego doesn't like it, but notice in the kind of behind the ego, your jit jai goes, ah, of course, binyang ni eng, it's always been that way. This was only part of the story. That's uh. Uh, that never was a tipung, never was a, a, a foundation or a reliable, uh, say, basis for life. Uh, an even simpler kind of reflection that uh, uh, Lung Po Cha would encourage, even more simple than is that so, is so. It works very well in English. So, <laughs> so that uh, he say, oh, that's great. So. I'm really happy. So. This is awful. So this is this is terrible. I hate this. So uh, I was really looking forward to this, and I'm really disappointed. So very very simple. But again, if you uh, to make it work, you have to apply that reflection. You have to catch the mood to kind of take the picture, snap, <laughs> kind of uh, you know, uh, take the snapshot, and notice the mind is making a judgment, and then say so. And in that moment, we're lighting up the wisdom of our own heart. We're illuminating that attitude with the wisdom mind. Uh, another uh, way that uh, Lung Po Cha encouraged us to reflect is to say, he'd, he'd hold up a, a glass like this, and he'd, he'd say, this is a broken glass. This is a broken glass. If you can see that this glass is already broken, then uh, in the future you won't suffer. If you think this glass is a solid, permanent thing, then in the future you will suffer. Now, when I was a, 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 a novice, and he would hold that, say, Ni gao ni, dek lao. I'd say, oh, I can't see a crack. <laughs> and I would say, oh, maybe I should sit closer because I can't see the break. I didn't make a jai. I didn't understand the teaching at that point. I thought, oh, it's really good. It can still hold water, even when it's broken. Oh, D mark. Maybe he's come some some kind of abiniham, some kind of psychic power. 
But it wasn't. It was the psychic power of wisdom. Because he'd say, if you can see that this glass is already broken, then when the day comes that the elements separate, then rather than you being disappointed, you'll recognize, oh, it was going to do that anyway, and now its day has come. Then tamada tamachat. That's ordinary, that's natural. If you think it's a glass and it's a permanent glass, when it breaks, then you'll think, oh, my, my favorite glass. And again, when I was a, a novice at, at Wat Bhaya Nanachat, there was a, a, a Thai monk who was working on one of the sewing machines. You know, we, we sew our own robes. And in those days, there, were no, there was no electricity at Wat Bhaya Nanachat in those days. So you had to use the treadle, uh, Singer sewing machines. And uh, this monk was trying to fix the, the, the thread, was tangled. So he was trying to use a screwdriver to, to get the, the plate off the, the bottom of the sewing machine to untangle the thread. And I got focused on him, sort of trying to turn this screw that was stuck. He was kind of leaning on the screwdriver. And suddenly, the screwdriver broke. And I was so concentrated on what he was doing. As soon as the screwdriver broke, I thought, damn. And as, as I thought, damn, he said, Ani Chang. <laughs> and it really took me by surprise. Because to me, it was like, oh, that screwdriver... It was, a, it was a real screwdriver, and it, it, it let us down. It broke. Oh. But uh, he immediately saw it was always Anicca. And it's Anicca, Nus, just got uh, actualized, <laughs> as it were. But that, that was, uh, it was always Anicca, and now it's screwdriverness has gone. <laughs> it was always Anicca. So that was a, a moment of, of insight. So if we can recognize the, gr the glass is already broken, then when the day comes that things break and that they go away, then we are ready for that. So it's easy with a glass. When it comes to our body, it's a bit more difficult. Or the bodies of our, our loved ones, our, our mother, our father, our, our spouses, our children, our ajahn, our luxit. <laughs> uh, then it's, it's more challenging. And so... This is one of the, uh, I, uh, I am the Jawad at Amaravati in, in England, so every day I receive people coming to visit. So uh, every single day people come uh, to the monastery and often they're asking advice, oh, uh, what to do because their, their father is dying or the, their, their wife just died or their, their children, their child is sick in hospital and these uh, ordinary events of our human life, they're kind of stressful and difficult and or uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, somebody came and said, oh, my, my brother passed away uh, last week. Maybe they're here this evening. I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't see. <laughs> but, uh, oh, my brother, he was only 54 years old, didn't even realize he was ill, just had a heart attack, died last week. Um, and so when those things happen, we're sad, and there's a sense of, there's a sense of loss. But if we develop the Anicca Sanya, that took sing took yang my if we recognize everything is always uncertain then we uh, we look at this body and we think well it's here at the moment but tomorrow my nair or tonight my nair it's not a sure thing if we develop that then when the time comes that uh, the life uh, ends or a sickness comes or we can't see so well anymore or we can't think so well anymore then rather than i had this ability to think and now it's been taken away, I've lost this. Rather, we recognize, oh, this was, nature was always working this way. Things come together and then they, they fall apart. For a period of time, we can walk and talk and think clearly, remember people's names, uh, and then that's, that works for some time, and then things, things change, either slowly or quickly. But that's tamada, tamachat, that's ordinary, that's natural. If we prepare ourselves, then when somebody in our family has a heart attack and dies or we have a, a sickness or suddenly we can't remember our brother's name, then rather th it's, it's not something that we, that we would choose or we, we like, but instead of, damn, we, we recognize anichang. Our heart is ready for it. So the Buddha encouraged what he called the five subjects for frequent recollection. Jaradamomi jarang anatito. I am of the nature to age, uh, I have not gone beyond aging. Bayadi dhammomi bayading anatito. 
I am of the nature to sicken. I've not gone beyond sickness. Marna, and uh, so for, for death as well, and uh, the, uh, 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 the reflection that all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. So everything that we feel we possess is going to leave. Now to the ego, that's really depressing. Chame? You're going to get old, you, you, if you're lucky. <laughs> you're, you're subject to sickness and you're going to die. Every single one of these bodies here will stop breathing one day. That's not a guess. That's a fact. No one gets off this boat alive. Right? All these bodies one day will stop breathing. Now, something in us is surprised when we hear those words. For a moment, the ego goes, but, 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 but. But then we think, well, of course. How could it not be that way? So the Buddha's teaching is preparing us for that, of course. It's always been that way. Uh, and so if we are prepared when those changes happen, then we're not pretending that the bitter is sweet, but we're ready for it. Oh, this is, this is how it is. This, is. this change has come. I used to be able to see clearly. I can, I can see the time on the clock that it's just past eight, but it's kind of blurry. <laughs> I can't see as well as I used to. Sometimes I forget people's names. The, it's changing. So if I uh, have developed the anicca sanya, that recollection of uncertainty, then as those changes happen, rather than feeling I was the possessor, the owner of those faculties, and now I have lost them, instead it's, oh, here is nature changing. This is kom tamacha plian playing. This is just nature doing its thing. comes together, then it falls apart. And the heart is, is, at, is at ease, even as things are decaying and falling apart, nothing is lost. Because the heart is identified with the Dhamma, rather than with everything that is impermanent, with our, our hair color, or our eyes, or our, our hearing, or our ability to think and move, and so on. So uh, I offer these thoughts for reflection this evening, and we can have a bit of time for some uh, uh, questions and responses, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, say be, ab uh, be able to receive your your thoughts, your reflections, and any uh, questions you have. Be uh, most welcome to ask whatever you like. This microphone is not sure. All right, so um, we have two microphones out there, and um, you are very welcome to go um, to the microphone and ask questions. Or if you are very shy, you can just write something on the paper and give it to me, and I'll read it out to Ajahn. Yes, we have like, we can take like two, three questions. Wow, everyone is so sure. No one, wow. I can say, don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Song sign what loud? Everyone oh, is free from doubt? One. Oh, there's one there. Yes, yes very good. Does this? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you very much for for the talk. And when when I was listening to you, it, it reminded me of one of the things that Joggang Trungpa used to say about you know the bad news is that we're in free fall, and the good thing is that there's no ground. Um, but I, I was kind of thinking that with within the minor. Um, that, that hits the heart, that hits us in and, and touches us into the place of, of the not knowing, um, that there is a natural orientation um, towards, towards goodness, so that there's, um, that although there is uncertainty, there is, it's, it opens out to a certainty of a different, a different kind. And I, I wondered what you thought about that. 
That's a, a good, uh, good question, observation. So the, uh, that's the, the purpose of recognizing that the, the, the world of the, the perceptions and senses is uncertain. It's, uh, it, we, it's because we're trying to find certainty in that which is uncertain that we create suffering. We look for security in that which is insecure, like insurance companies and reputations and physical health. So that the point of challenging those poor investments, <laughs> if you like, that we, we put our heart into, th into, uh, into things that are not satisfying or not stable, it's so that we can find a, a, a greater security, a greater stability, a greater certainty. So that in a sense it's letting go of the, the, the habits of identifying with the body, with the personality, with our, our, you know, our jobs, our roles, our, our stories, and, and le letting the heart identify with its own nature, which is the nature of Dhamma itself. You know, the, uh, one of the, the aspects of the, of the teaching that the, uh, Lumpur Cha would emphasize, he said it's not just a matter of hearing Dhamma, and practicing Dhamma and realizing Dhamma, but really the path is fulfilled in being Dhamma. Because every aspect of this body and this mind is part of the natural order, right? Even this microphone, yeah? uh, even the, you know, the plastic electric fittings, they're part of the natural order. They're put together by humans, but humans are also part of the natural order. <laughs> there. So every aspect of body and mind in the material world is part of, of the natural order. And nature, in the Thai language, we, uh, we use the word tamachat, which comes from the Pali Dhamma Jati, born of the Dhamma. And so, uh, again, Lumpur Cha would say, Dhamma is nature, nature is Dhamma, Dhamma ben Tamacha, Tamacha ben Tam. So that if every aspect of the body and mind is part of nature, is an attribute of nature, then that means that the mind is Dhamma. And so what we're doing with, with practicing Dhamma is recognizing, it's like not so I, I was a person and now I'm, be, I'm becoming the Dhamma, but rather every aspect of who and what we are has always been Dhamma. But because the, uh, the mind is so identified with this body, this personality, our story, our gender, our name, and so on, then we, we forget that, we miss that. We, we get identified with the, the details and we, we take refuge in those uh, superficial characteristics. So the, the development of insight the path of insight and using the that gateway of of uh, mainair, of uncertainty is uh, as i was saying you're you're training uh, the heart to not try and seek security in that which is insecure to in, sen in a sense to awaken to that which is totally reliable which is the the dhamma itself which is what we've always been but we we didn't we don't realize because of the uh, the impact of the senses and the the kind of the experience of, of birth in a, the human realm. So, the, uh, uh, that attraction of goodness, if you like, is part of the, uh, the qualities of Dhamma itself. Is that, that, the, that which is wholesome and noble is intrinsically pleasing, and that which is unwholesome and ignoble is naturally painful. So that it's a, uh, uh, the heart's own response, uh, and uh, the love of of the, the good. It's not like me loving the good, it's rather more like the, the Dhamma loving the, 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 uh, the Dhamma. <laughs> that, uh, which is, uh, it, it can sound a little bit inflated or, or uh, maybe confusing, but I feel that's it's a very helpful insight and so that even though you don't have s those exact words in the Pali Canon, like the, the Buddha saying it's um, uh, you know that the, the uh, after hearing Dhamma, uh, practicing Dhamma, understanding Dhamma, realizing Dhamma, and then being Dhamma, the Buddha doesn't use exactly those words, but there are places where people describe the Buddha, saying you know, he is the Dhamma, and that uh, there's a that's a phrase used by some of the Buddha's disciples, and then also the Buddha himself talking to Vakali, You know, if you. If you see the, if you see me, you see the Dhamma. If you see the Dhamma, you see me. So, uh, in a, a Buddhist country like this, to to say 
to use words like you know I am the Dhamma or I am the Buddha it can seem like really inflated or outrageous you know heretical Chai Mai? is that right but uh, that, that's exactly why Lumpur Cha would say things like you know, the the Buddha that is a refuge is not the Buddha who lived two and a half thousand years ago because he's gone you know, that, that uh, he uh, his life came to an end but the the Buddha that is the Sarana that is a genuine refuge here and now is that puru, the awareness of your own heart. So that would be challenging to people, but because people recognized him as an arahant, say, well, he's an arahant, he can't be wrong. So, whew, you know, that, uh, but he would use that kind of statement to help to help people to see themselves differently, not to create an inflated ego, but to, in a sense, uh, recognize that they are. Uh, they have that quality that their fundamental nature of mind is Dhamma itself. So one of the the ways you you can take a simple phrase uh, like this, like uh, the the mind is not a uh, the mind is not a person. So that to just take a sim in your meditation to bring uh, to bring that into it into consciousness. Say the mind is not a person. Or the mind is dhamma, chit ben tam, made ben kon. You know, the the heart is dhamma. It's not a person. And just sort of drop that into the into the field of awareness and see what happens. Again, the ego will say, but 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 but, <laughs> or that can't be right, or how can that be, or or. But then again, if we listen to the heart, it says, oh, that's right. The mind is not a person. Oh. And something recognizes that, I would, at least in this experience, <laughs> as something recognizes that as true. And in that recognition, there's a, a freedom, there's a spaciousness. And so that, that spaciousness and that awareness, that I would say is what's really reliable and is the, the, the sarana. That's why we call them the, the refuges, Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, uh, refuges. They're a safe place, they're a, a secure, reliable foundation. So we let go of, uh, uh, say, instead of putting your investments in a dodgy bank, you put them in a really secure bank instead. All right, we've got one more question. You can, you can come here. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for coming here and giving me a talk, even if it was not sure <laughs> talk. But I'm visiting a few of these kind of Dhamma talks being listening for that for a couple of years and uh, um, different instructions being given. And my question is quite simple. Once, of the once a very wise monk said that in order to progress on the path of Vipassana, you need to find a Kamatana teacher who has already attained a Namarupa Parigana. And uh, my question is very... Namarupa Parigana. Pari, uh, maybe I'm not pronouncing it well, but it's, uh, it's a quality, uh, a mastery, mastery of the mind and the physical body. Maybe your, um, our Namru, colleague... Namru. Namru, yeah. right. So my question is how to find such a teacher and what qualities to look for? Good question. Thanks. Man. Well, the, it's, um, it's rather like how do you find a good restaurant? You know, you, you try, you keep trying them till you till you find one that says, "Oh, this is this this feels good." And I, I'm kind of joking, and I'm kind of not joking, because different uh, different teachings, different teachers work for different people. So somebody might go to the person who said that the statement that you quoted and go, "Wow, that's absolutely perfect. That changes my life. That's amazing. That's so helpful." And the person sitting next to them feels, what's that? Well, you know, I'm wa wasting my time here. You know, big, you know, this, is, this is not helping at all. And so it's like, you know, you, you find a restaurant you really like, oh, this is amazing, this is fantastic, this is really good. You take your friend and then she says, is this the right place? <laughs> so y y uh, if you want to follow the path of the Buddha, uh, it's a part of experimentation. It's a part of exploring. And so, uh, uh, over and over and over again, I, I, I say to people, you have to find out for yourself. There's no uh, one size that fits all. 
different expressions work for different people. And so uh, even though someone, their, their words might be very accurate, they might be very well, well considered, that person might be an arahant, but still their words can, can fall completely flat. Uh, and they're just something about their, their manner or the way they speak can switch somebody off completely. And the person next to them is, wow, this is so great, this is amazing, this is, this is wonderful. So you, yeah, uh, I would say you need to just look around and to visit different people or listen to different teachings and, and see where the heart, uh, uh, listen to where the heart sings. And, and th that chemistry of this really makes sense or I really trust this person or that feels so perfect. And don't expect it to be the same for everybody around you. Uh, but to test for yourself and, and see what really brings benefit. But and the, the wording is going to change, you know. The, that, uh, but that would be my my recommendation, and uh, that use your own experience. Yeah, jumbo. All right. Not to go too much over time. I think this is the yeah our last question. Okay. Brother Ajahn, I have one question for you. Since your Buddhist name is Amaro and your temple is Amaravati. Both have a definition of deathless. Can you explain more a bit more of this paradoxical nature of the Buddhist, you know, the Buddhist Dhamma, and you know, with anicca and deathless? And well, the uh, uh, in a, in a sense is exactly what I was saying to our, our friend here in the the front row because uh, we uh, because of identification with the death bound uh, of bodies thoughts, moods, uh, material objects, then we create the causes of dukkha, of disappointment, of, uh, of insecurity. And so the, uh, the practice of Dhamma is learning to uh, let go of identification or pursuing the, 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 uh, uh, the, the death-bound, the, the transient, the unstable, in order to awaken to the deathless, the unborn, the undying. So, the uh, another of the characteristics of the of stream entry, just by coincidence, <laughs> is uh, is the uh, realizing the deathless. So, for example, many of you will know the story of uh, when uh, Sariputta and Moggallana were, were wanderers before they met the Buddha. Then uh, Sariputta, whose name was Upatissa, he saw the venerable Asaji on the Bindabhat, on the alms round, uh, in the walking through the town, and he was so impressed by Venerable Asaji, by his demeanor, his coolness, his brightness of his, uh, of his face and his peacefulness. And then uh, Venerable, he stopped Venerable Asaji and said, well, who is your teacher? What's your practice? You know, you're, you are very radiant, you're very peaceful. Uh, what is it that you've awakened to? So then Venerable Asaji gave him a very short teaching uh, about cause and effect. And then immediately uh, Upatissa, the wanderer Upatissa, uh, awakened to the deathless. And so then when he, uh, he went back to, to meet with his friend Moggallana uh, and, uh, uh, and they'd made a vow that whoever discovered, whoever awakened to the deathless first would go and tell the other. So he went back to his, uh, to his buddy and, said, and then he could, Moggallana could see, oh, you've changed, your, your appearance is very different, you look very peaceful, very serene. Have you awakened to the deathless? And Sariputi said, indeed, I've awakened to the deathless. So that's uh, the synonymous with, with stream entry. So it's recognizing there is that dimension of our being uh, which is unborn, which is undying, which is timeless. So when we recite the qualities of the Dhamma, Sanditiko Akaliko, apparent here and now timeless. So that's uh, the quality of the Dhamma, which is not outside, but it's really uh, the, the fundamental uh, nature of our own mind, our own heart. So it's awakening uh, to the, the unborn, undying quality. So this is the mysterious a aspect of our life. You know, we were born as human beings. These bodies were born and time passes. It's now 20 past 8. So the time is definitely passing. We're getting older. Our hair is getting grayer as we sit here. All of us. <laughs> Even the youngest of us. Uh, but 
through the the window of the the mortal and the and the transient, the immortal, the the the, uh, the, the timeless can be realized. That's one of the, the the mysterious qualities of this human birth, through the born and death bound through the agency of this human life, the unborn, the undying, can be realized. And that was the motivation of the, of the Buddha before his own enlightenment. Uh, the, uh, the, his own description of his motivation was when he was a prince in the palace, he considered, why should I, subject to aging and sickness and defilement and death, why should I also chase after things that are similarly subject to uh, aging and sickness and defilement and death? Instead, why don't I seek the unaging, the undefiled, the unailing, the deathless? And so I, and then he said, and so I did. So that was his consideration: was that I'm chasing after all of this limited, uh, dependent, death-bound stuff. Why don't I uh, look beyond that? And so that it's a it's a mysterious thing that uh, through this this human life we can recognize that which is beyond the human. Well, like I said, you know, the mind is not a person. So, uh, through the agency of a personal life, uh, the mind can awaken to its own nature, which is beyond the personal, beyond time, beyond space, beyond individuality. So, that could be the beginning of a long evening, but it'll need to be the end. So, um, <laughs> so I, I'll finish on that point. All right. Um, I would like to conclude this evening by thank, give a big thanks to uh, well, British, uh, Buddhist Fellowship of Buddhists and uh, of course Ajahn Amaro for the most insightful talk as always. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and um, yes, that's it and may you go home safely encountering no traffic and even if you do, I hope you don't curse it but uh, may you be able to say to yourself that this ter terrible ter traffic is um, maybe not so bad, not too sure. Alright, um, good night. <laughs>